All right, folks, this chapter, chapter 9, is all about geologic time, right? So let's look at the whole kind of history of our, our planet here. Uh, first of all, Earth has a 4.55 billion year. That's represented by the, the symbols GY, G standing for giga, meaning a billion. Uh, billion year history, right? Uh, our, as humans... We have had a very short residence uh, time on this Earth compared to the whole history of the planet, right? And geologic time, deep time, it's one of these things that uh, is very, very hard to uh, for us to wrap our minds around, right? I mean, as people, we can imagine about a hundred years or so, right? I mean, it's a little longer than the average human lifespan, but you know, we live, you know, pretty close to that on average. So a hundred years isn't too far out of the grasps for, uh, you know, most people, but what about even a thousand years ago? You know, a thousand years ago, there were knights and swords and castles and all that, right? I mean, that's a long time ago. How about 10,000 years ago? A hundred thousand, a million. A billion years right I mean these are time frames that we can't even begin to comprehend right and as a geologist if anybody understands deep time it's a geologist but as a geologist I'll be the first to admit I have no idea what a million years is like right it's a long period of time so as a result there have been a number of different attempts to you know put this more into terms the whole history of our planet something that we would relate to and one of the popular ones is is relating the entire history of our, our planet 4.55 billion years ago till now being an entire calendar year right so january 1st was 4 billion 4.55 billion years ago right and right now is you know midnight on um on january 31st right almost new new year's eve right if we compress the entire history of our planet uh, into that time frame, humans would arrive on the scene at about 11.37 p.m. on December 31st, so about 23 minutes before midnight, right? Uh, that's compared to an entire year, right? And this little dot right here, this is uh, the whole duration of our hominin ancestors, right? So we're talking a vast, vast amount of time, right? Now, Generally in geology, there's two different types of dating that we use. One is called relative dating, and the other one is absolute dating. By relative dating, I don't mean moving to Kentucky and marrying your cousin. What I'm talking about is determining this is first, that came second, this came fourth, right? Relative to the rest of it, right? So we're determining stuff like what is older, what is younger, what came first, what happened next. Right? We're determining a sequence of events, sequence of events that things happened in, right? Uh, and we're creating what we call a rock column, right? A composite kind of section that represents a reliable history of, of Earth's record, right? Um, now, you don't find any one place on the Earth that you can go and just see, you know, straight from 4.55 billion years till now, right? You got to take little pieces here, little pieces there, and, and match, them up, match them up and stick them together and build up a nice big composite uh, section representing a reliable history of our planet, right? It is very important to note, though, that there is no time implied right? No time in, in number of years implied at all. That's the realm of absolute dating, right? So relative dating says this was older than that, that is younger than this, but it doesn't tell us if it happened, you know, 10 days ago or 10 million years ago. A couple of laws that apply to, uh, to relative dating, and especially to sedimentary rocks, rocks laid down as sediments, and there was a uh, stated by this guy named Nikolai Steno uh, back in the 1600s, right? And these again, remember last uh, chapter we were talking about, or the first chapter we were talking about, uh, you know, scientific laws and, and theories and all that, right? Now these are some of these laws, right? They And laws again, they state relationships. They do not, you know, attempt to uh, look at the how or the why, just the here it is, right? So Steno has four laws that will help us look at and interpret uh, the history of various rock sections. First of all, the law of superposition. 
at the time when any given stratum was being formed, yada, 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 yada. Basically, this is saying that younger rocks are on top of older rocks, right? So how can I put a rock, you know, on top of this rock if this rock isn't here, right? So younger and younger rocks are put on top of older rocks, right? The principle of original horizontality. Strata either perpendicular to the horizon or inclined at the horizon or runs parallel to yada yada, right? What this is basically saying, our sedimentary locks are laid down in horizontal layers. And this is because they're deposited as a fluid, either in water or air. Uh, and they're going to try to reach, you know, uh, the lowest potential energy state, which is flat horizontal strata. The principle of lateral continuity. Uh, basically, this is saying that the layers will continue until they run into something, a physical something, as is a mountain or a valley wall, uh, or a, a, a uh, you know, a new environment, right? So think about moving from, you know, Lake Michigan onto the beach and sand dunes, right? So, you know, lake deposits will be where the lake is, you know, and, and they will gradually go move into different, uh, um, different uh, uh, environments, right? And then the principle of cross-cutting relationships. If a body or discontinuity cuts across a stratum, it must have been formed after that stratum. Basically, it's saying uh, the rock has to be there before you can do something to it. So you can't break the rock until the rock is already there, right? You can't insert a volcanic you know, intrusion into something that's not there, right? So again, those those four laws. These are going to help us look at uh, and interpret the um, the um, uh, uh, su uh, sequence of events that happens at different locations, right? So again, law of superposition: younger rocks are on top of older rocks. Principle of original horizontality: sedimentary rocks are laid down in in horizontal layers. Principle of lat lateral continuity: layers will continue until they run into something that ends them. Right? And the principle of cross-cutting relationships, uh, the rock has to be there before you can do something to it. Right? Let's investigate some of these laws here. So here's a nice bunch of sedimentary layers of rock. Right, And which of these laws are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing that they're laid down horizontally. Right, As you can see here, these layers tend to continue horizontally. Right? We also will notice that the oldest layers are on the bottom and we get younger and younger and younger and younger and younger layers towards the top, right? Because you can't put this younger layer on top of the older layer if the older layer isn't there, right? Pretty simple. Again, oldest layers on bottom, youngest layers on top. Right? Here are some sedimentary layers that have been tilted right so these layers are no longer uh, horizontal as we can see they're up at kind of an angle this means something must have happened to them we call this something uplift right when rocks are lifted up they're uplifted that's what we call it when things are, are tilted and and move from their original position and vertically or horizontally right this is a special type uh, of sequence of events here that we can determine. This one's called an angular unconformity. An unconformity simply means missing rock or missing time, right? So what happened here, right? Well, let's take a look. So to form this angular unconformity, first the oldest rocks were deposited at the bottom, right? Younger and younger rocks then deposited on top of each other, right? We must remember these were originally deposited horizontally, right? So then this whole area, which was once horizontal, right, has now been uplifted and tilted, right? So that's uplift it was experienced, right? So we have, you know, deposition, the oldest one, right? Younger and younger and younger and younger. Then the whole area is uplifted. And then, very importantly, right at this horizon here, a period of erosion occurs, right? And we can see that because it's a pretty um, kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of an undulating little wavy surface. But notice how these lower tilted blocks, right, these tilted units are just dramatically cut off almost flat, right? That means erosion was occurring. Right. So then a period of erosion occurs. Right. 
and then finally we deposit the youngest layers on top but again these these layers are now being deposited horizontally again right so from oldest to youngest let's go back you know we have youngest layers here or oldest layers here sorry younger and younger and younger layers deposit on top then the whole thing is uplifted then a big period of erosion occurs making a nice flat surface and then we have the deposition of these new yet still horizontal layers on top of this. This is known as a angular unconformity. Right? Here's another example of cross-cutting relationships. Right. So take a look at this uh, this uh, block diagram here of our Earth, and what we're seeing are um, layers of of, uh, of rock, right, being laid down horizontally, right, and then we're seeing these. Uh, uh, magma and lava pockets that are intruding or cutting through and into uh, these uh, sedimentary rocks, right? So these dikes, these what these are known as, are dikes. Dikes are things that cut across and sills kind of go almost parallel with the bedding, right? So these dikes and sills cut across or cut through these other layers of rock. Therefore, this must be younger. How do we know that? Because you can't cut through this rock if this rock's not there, right? So here I would say we have, you know, older rocks, younger, 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 younger rocks, right? And then the intrusion of this big magma body, which caused a bunch of dikes and sills to cut through it, right? So again, this means that these rocks must be older than the features that cut them, right? So the rocks are older, and the dikes and sills cutting through them are younger. Here's an example from the wild here, right? So we have these white colored dikes cut through the older gray granite. We know that because they cut through them. So this granite must have been here first because you can't put this inside something that's not there. Right. Here's another example. We have sedimentary layers that are cut by a dike, right? So here we see all those nice horizontal layers, right? And then a dike came cutting through. So this dike must be younger. Right? Some other important uh, uh, advancements in, in um, relative dating were done by William Smith, also known as Strata Smith. A uh, very famous English geologist back in the 17 and 1800s, and what he did, uh, for first he published this first nationwide geological map of England, and as they were making and cutting all these ditches, he was surveying them and noticed that, you know, certain types of rocks from one end of the country to the other had certain types of fossils associated with them. It became very famous for, uh, you know, doing kind of a party trick. He says, bring me fossils and I shall tell you which layer they came from. And, you know, ended up being correct, right? And because of this, uh, the principle of faunal succession, the reason he would know which layers uh, uh, the uh, fossils came from, is because fossils change and they evolve, right? Now, this is before uh, Darwin's, you know, uh, theory of evolution was published. I mean, evolution was still a thing back then, but it wasn't, you know, mechanism wasn't given it till, till Darwin got to it. But uh, so this is before Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species. Um, but he still noticed that sedimentary rocks contain, you know, fossil flora, which has plants and fauna, which is animals, right? And these fossils tend to succeed each other in a very specific, reliable and predictable way. Right? And that's because they evolve as time changes. Right? This order and therefore the rocks that they're in can then be identified you know, and correlated over large horizontal distances where you don't necessarily aren't able to follow that rock, you know, one end of England to the other. But you can identify the fossils right, and correlate them from one side of the country to the other side of the country, from one area to another area. Right, and so here's an example of faunal succession. Right, so this is say site A, and this is site B, and in between them we don't know what's going on. Right, but we can infer based on the fossils. Right, so we know that if we find these fossils, you know, this is one layer, next layer, next layer, next layer, right, next layer, next layer. If we look at the other site, we see a similar sequence. So we find those oldest fossils. Right. 
we find the second oldest fossils, right? We find the third oldest fossils, right? But then so it appears that, you know, we're finding these fossils over here in four and five that we're not finding over here. But instead, right on top of, of three here, we're finding six, right? And then seven, which is not found here. This is showing us that there's a period of non-deposition over here or erosion that occurred, uh, removing the time periods in, that to add fossils five and four in them. So we're allowed, to, able now to correlate these times from one area to the other, knowing that these fossils and these fossils lived at the same time, these fossils and these fossils lived at the same time. And this helps us to identify areas where we may, may be missing time. So this would be what we call an unconformity, right? And this brings us to, you know, kind of throwing this all together into this idea of, of uh, a relative age dating and sequence of events, right? And the sequence of events is, is determining in which order these, these geological events tended to happen, right? Or, or happen, right? So, again, no time implied. We're just doing first, second, third, this, then that, then that, right? We don't know if it was a billion years apart or 500,000 years apart or what, right? So things that we want to look for when we're trying to determine sequence of events, right? Deposition, right? Older units on top of younger unit, or on, I'm sorry, younger units on top of older units, right? Erosion, and we looked at that, right? And we might see areas where there's, you know, what we call disconformities, right? Our angular unconformity, even though there was a period of erosion there. We can look for telltale signs, or we can look at the fossils, to see if time is missing, right? And erosion also marks times of unconformities, which are gaps in the rock record, right? I mean, there's other types, but, you know, if there's a, a you know, an erosion surface, that's definitely an unconformity. We would look for things like intrusions down here. This Zoroaster granite is intruding into, right, this, uh, this Visnu schist. We look for things like uplift, right? The tilting of those rock layers. Notice that these are all uplifted. Well, these sediments are not, they're still nice and flat, right? And we'll look for other things like folding and that's rocks bend and then faulting. And that is when rocks break and move relative to each other. Right? And then we'll use also the principle of faunal succession to help us identify other missing gaps in the time and rock record, right? So let's practice with this with just a couple of these, right? So let's look at this sequence here. If we notice, right, using our, our principles of relative dating, right, we have B being the oldest, C being deposited on top of that, D being deposited on top of that, and then we have a couple ways we can go here, right? We can either say E was deposited, right, and then we got the intrusion of A, Right? But that's because E doesn't, you know, maybe this wasn't here yet, or but that doesn't cut all the way through here, so we know if it just didn't make it there. So one interpretation is first B, then C, then D, then E, then A. Another interpretation would be B, then C, then D, then A, then E. There's all, you know, often a couple uh, uh, different uh, options that are are acceptable, right? This one only really has one solution. So let's take a look at the order of events here. Right? First, we have layer C being deposited. Then we have layer B. Then we have layer A, right? Then dike D cuts through all of that, right? And then E cuts through everything else, right? So it must have been first this happened, then that happened then this happened, then the dike come through it, and then this fault cut the whole thing, right? So this is sequence of events. And as you can see, they can get pretty complex. Right? Now, the other kind of dating that we have is absolute dating, right? And this is the dating that gives us time in years before present, right? Present being defined as 1950. Why is that? Well, that's kind of when we discovered radiometric dating and started to use it. So they decided you need to set a P for present, right? That is 1950. So we are all now living 70 years into the future. Congratulations, right? 
there are a bunch of different types of radiometric dating, right? Uh, carbon-14 is probably one you've heard of, right? Argon, argon, potassium, argon, uranium, lead, rubidium, strontium. These are all um, different things that we can date. And basically what they are, they're, um, these are all radioactive elements, right? That decay, right? And they decay at a certain rate, at a known rate. And this is called half-life decay, right? So the half-life of something is the time it takes to go from your initial amount of it to half of that amount. So if you start with 10 grams, after one half-life, you would have 5 grams left, right? And after a second half-life, you would have 2.5 grams left. And after a third half-life, right, you'd have 1.75 grams left, right? So we can generally do radiometric dating out to about 10 half-lives or so. Um, with most of these tests. And as you can see, many of these, you know, uh, that just goes well beyond the formation of our Earth. So carbon-14, actually using an advanced technique called atomic mass spectrometry, we can get that back to about 100,000 years, right? And some other forms of absolute data that we can do, dendrochronology, big word that means tree ring dating, right? Everybody knows trees grow in, you know, yearly rings, right? And the tree has a good year it'll be a thick ring and if it has a drought year it'll be a thin ring well taking these you know counting the number of rings and and lining these thick and thin rings up from one tree to the next allows us to date back well a few thousand years ago here in the southwest united states actually right but beyond that we have ice cores right and uh, just like, you know, the rock record, we don't have one ice core that goes back this whole time. But taking this one and that one and that one and putting them together, uh, we can build a record that goes back 800,000 years, uh, year by year, basically, because ice builds up in yearly rings kind of like trees do, right? So putting this all together, we have built what's known as the geologic time scale, right? And the geologic time scale was created using relative dating exclusively, mostly using fossils, right? These, this, this principle of faunal succession and matching from one area to the other, right? So long before we could ever put this, you know, uh, absolute dating in here, long before that, uh, we had deciphered all of this, these different eras and periods and stuff of, of uh, the history of our planet, mainly using the fossils and big changes in the fossil record and stuff like that that occur, right? The dates then were added later after the invention, you know, of radiometric dating, right? So I would like you to learn the following eras of history of life on our planet. And notice that when we're talking about these, these dates and stuff, MA means millions of years ago, right? So the oldest one, is the Precambrian. This goes from the beginning of our planet, 4.55 billion years ago, to 544 million years ago. After that, we have the Paleozoic. Paleo means old, zoic means life. This means ancient life, right? And this part goes from 544 million years all the way to 240. Uh, 251 million, sorry. Right. After that, we have the Mesozoic. Meso means middle, so we have middle life. The Mesozoic right in here goes from 251 million years to 65 million years ago. And then the last one, the one we are currently in, the Cenozoic, Ceno meaning in recent or modern. This is the modern life and the modern times we are in, right? And the reason they call these modern life, middle life, and ancient life is the further you go back in time, the less and less stuff looks like it does today. All right. So if I dropped you back in the Cenozoic and uh, in a time machine, uh, you know, say a couple of thousand years, you know, about a hundred thousand years ago, you say, "Oh, that big furry thing chasing me, obviously some sort of elephant." Right. If I dropped you back in the Mesozoic, things would be a little weirder. Say, "Ah, oh, that weird thing chewing on my leg is obviously some sort of reptile." Right. But in the Paleozoic, you go back there, you have no idea what the heck that thing is that's chasing you. You just got to get away, right? All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next time.